Why don't we start? My name is Pablo Polizzo, uh, and I'm the director of the Latin American Research Center. Uh, and I would like to start by taking the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Blackfoot and the people of uh, Treaty 7 region uh, here in southern Alberta, which includes the Siksika, the Kukani, the Kainai, the Tsutina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, including Chiniki, Bear Spa, and Wesley First Nation One. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for uh, coming and thank the uh, Calgary Public Library and their wonderful team for uh, allowing us to host this event and for publicizing this event. Uh, and it is the first event that we're doing with the, uh, the library, and we hope it's uh, the first of many to come. Um, I would also like to thank Gabriela Alonso from the Workland School of Education at the University of Calgary who first brought this idea to us uh, that uh, uh, to hold this dialogue uh, to coincide with the meeting of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. So before we go on, maybe I'll ask Gabriela to come up and just explain what the purpose of the meeting that the IAI is uh, 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 hosting this week at the uh, UFC and in Bank. So thank you. Um, you short there? So um, thank you for, for being here. Um, we are a group of 27 um, participants that are um, engaging in conversations about transdisciplinary work. As Pablo mentioned, the, the event or the whole seminar, which lasts seven days here in Calgary, is organized by the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, research along with the University of Calgary International, the work in the School of Education. And, and education is um, an important aspect of the work that we are trying to achieve here. We have been having conversation about how to collaborate with uh, non-academic communities, how to engage in truly um, actionable science. So we, we are having this conversation in this context, uh, or in the larger context of the professional development seminar on transdisciplinary approaches for integrating policy and science for sustainability. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank our distinguished panelists, who Jay Ingram will introduce in just a second. Um, I want to thank uh, Michael Doyle uh, from uh, the uh, board of the Latin American Research Center, who uh, has been uh, really tireless in his efforts in helping us put this panel together. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Monique Greenwood uh, from uh, the LARC, uh, who has uh, also uh, worked tremendously hard uh, to help us uh, put this together. So this is the third in the Latin American Research Center uh, Dialogues series. Um, and the aim of this series is uh, to host, uh, is to serve as a forum uh, to host leading voices from across the region to advance uh, discussion around issues of contemporary significance in the Americas and beyond. And a dialogue is neither a debate nor is it a formal panel presentation. And this series uh, features not only scholars, uh, but also experts with a wide range of first-hand professional experience uh, in order to engage in dialogue uh, over and reach a better understanding of global challenges uh, and uh, possibly their solutions. So this aim really fits exactly with the aim of uh, the IAI conference um, uh, here in Calgary, uh, which is to explore how communicating science uh, uh, across fields and borders uh, can help us face uh, certain global challenges, particularly relating to climate change. And this disconnect between knowledge and action is a real problem for tackling complex socio-ecological uh, uh, conflicts across the Americas and beyond. We have four very distinguished uh, representatives who will speak uh, from four very different sectors to try to bridge uh, this gap. And we're delighted to host uh, this conversation in partnership with the library because these sorts of conversations need to be broadly inclusive, involving not only experts and scholars, but the public at large. Uh, we're also delighted to have Jay Ingram, who will be the moderator for this conversation and introduce the participants. Uh, Jay probably needs no introduction. Uh, he is a longtime and beloved Canadian science writer and broadcaster. Uh, he has uh, hosted two national science programs in Canada, works in ports uh, with the CBC Radio, 
and uh, the Daily Planet on Discovery Channel. He has written 15 books, uh, which have been translated into 16 languages. Uh, he's also written for Owl Magazine, wrote a weekly science column for the Toronto Star, and uh, is currently a columnist uh, for Canadian Wildlife Magazine. He has won countless awards for his writing, broadcasting, and efforts to popularize science, has six honorary degrees, and is a member of the Order of Canada and a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society. I will let Jay continue. I thought you said I needed no introduction. Uh, you know, I, I'm my. Uh, it's not important what I've done because when I listen to those things, I think, oh, that was in the past, but that's the former role I had. And so you might wonder, what am I doing now? But uh, tonight, my role. <coughs> is really to sit back, I will introduce the panel. Each panelist is going to speak very briefly to start, uh, five minutes is. And because they represent such diverse careers and backgrounds, it's going to be fascinating. But I want to make this really important point, <clears throat> and that is, it's not just going to be a discussion among the four panelists or, or me with the panelists. This is all of you. And we're really hoping and expecting that this dialogue, this conversation, involves all of you. So please don't hesitate to make comments, ask questions. Um, we have, a, I would say, a tough assignment tonight because we're trying to tackle some of the issues involved in communicating science, not just in the way I have for most of my career, which is to a relatively captive audience, uh, but across borders across disciplines, and I mean, a perfect example happened today in Canada when a proposed pipeline was abandoned by the company that was going to build it, and the political reaction uh, has gone across the entire spectrum. Environmentalists delighted, uh, some political parties angry. This is just, I think, uh, a perfect example of the kinds of issues that we're up against. So I am going to, oh, and I, I should mention this is being uh, video recorded. So if you are, you know what we like to say in public events is if you're sitting here, you've already agreed to be uh, video. So if you're uncomfortable with that, uh, we're going ahead with it. Can't guarantee that you won't be caught on camera at least briefly. So, to the speakers, uh, Dr. Dawn Baisley is sitting next to me. She's a biology professor at York University in Toronto. She's been there not yet 30 years, but getting close. Um, she is an ecologist, started her career in 1980, studying snow geese uh, near Hudson Bay, and uh, was irritated by polar bears eating her experimental subjects. Uh, she then went on to study sheep grazing in grass at Oxford University, which sounds like a bit of a jump. In 1990, she joined the Faculty of Science uh, at York, and she is now director of York's Sustainability Research Institute and is doing really interesting things right now on the history of botany and who was actually doing the real work the men who were called the botanists or the women that were actually doing the botany in the 19th century. Like, nothing has changed. <laughs> she also is very active in making uh, science more diverse and more inclusive. So, please welcome Dr. Don Baisley. I'd actually. I'm going to introduce the other people. You can, you can tell we have so. not rehearsed this. <laughs> but uh, why don't you. I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little bit. So, thank you, Jay, who I actually had the pleasure of working with Jay in 2016 on a ship sailing down the St. Lawrence River into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, where we were doing a lot of citizen science and engaging people with science who, who were on the ship. So, that was, that was a, a, a great. Pleasure to work with him before. So I'm an ecologist. Uh, I wake up every morning. I said this this morning when I gave my presentation in the seminar. 
extremely grateful that English has turned out to be the international language of science. Uh, which means that when I'm in countries like Sweden and Norway, my colleagues there uh, want to practice their English on me, and I say, oh, speak Swedish. You know, I need to learn to understand a little bit um, some very wonderful Spanish speakers and Portuguese speakers have been listening to me massacre the language this week. So I want to talk a little bit about about the history of science, because what we have been witnessing over the last few years, Jay, is I think a realization that the academy as we know it has to get out of the ivory tower, um, that science is international, that there is fabulous research that is being done all over the world, but not necessarily published in, in English as a language uh, in the journals, and that really it's our job to go and bring all of this to into the conversation for the simple reason that if we don't have all the voices at the table, so uh, my colleague, uh, the Dean of uh, Science at Ryerson, Imogen Co, likes to say, if the cure for cancer is in the mind of a girl, in certain countries in the world, we're never going to get it if they can't go to school and they can't be part of the science conversation. So I think that uh, with books like titles uh, like Escape from the Ivory Tower, I'm sure you've heard of that one, um, Don't Be Such a Scientist, uh, what, we've, what we're really seeing is a realization that the traditional way that science that I grew up in practiced by uh, professors uh, who are the experts, that's really, really, really got to change. And I, would, I, and I, and I am a champion for these sorts of things today, um, partly because um, I, I, I believe that diversity is our strength. And what we're now seeing is uh, calls uh, by the Minister of Science, Kirsty Duncan, for equity, diversity, and inclusivity to be put into action. And you mentioned the Nobel Prizes weren't men again, and there's been a lot of reaction on social media why these men were. Well, when you look at the history of how it's done, it doesn't necessarily, uh, it's not reflected in the way that the Nobel Prizes are given out. And I can tell you that when I joined the faculty at York University in 1990, and I was interested not just in having my insert grant, my research grant, my research papers, I've always been interested in what we might call public science or open science. I was on Clerks and Quarks, but not interviewed by you nearly 20 years ago. I think, I think, I think we figured that one out. It was Bob McDonald. Um, and people in the faculty would say, isn't it so strange that you want to go on the radio and talk about science? Why do you want to do that? Well, now there's been a real sea change and there's real recognition about the importance of getting out of the lab and communicating science. And we need to do that because the problems that we face from climate change and public are going to require all hands on deck, and that means making uh, science and the academy as inclusive as possible, and it means people like me are actually um, looking at the research that's published, not just in English, because there's so much of it there that is incredibly important, and I have to know about that, and I'll leave it there. Thank you, John. Um, well, I'm not really allowed to talk here today. It's not my job, but as soon as I hear about <coughs> scientists uh, you know, talking to the public, I've, I've talked to a lot of those scientists, and I, there's a gap. That's all I'll say. And maybe this subject will come up. So our next speaker is Cheryl Cardinal, uh, who has a daughter who loves robotics, and Cheryl is uh, interested in a wide variety of things. She's president and chief executive officer of the Indigenous Center of Energy. She has a degree from UBC. She studied at Dalhousie University's Tuck School of Business. And she works with Indigenous people from the U.S., Canada, New Zealand, and Australia on issues including climate change, sustainability, renewable energy, mining, big, big issue in um, many countries in the world, South America particularly, and oil and gas. Uh, she's launched the Indigenous Conference on Energy and Mining. Her work has been recognized by the U.S. State Department, and she is pre and post sales. Thank you. 
and I'm a citizen of the Sacred Creek Free Nation in Alberta. So, you can, unlike Don, you can speak to me. <laughs> no, I knew that. I was just waiting to make sure you were done. Um, I'd like to first recognize the traditional territory of the Treaty 7 people, so I say Blackfoot, Sutina, and Stony, as well as Métis Region 3. We often forget about the Métis, so I'd like to thank you for, for remembering them. Uh, I'm a member of Treaty 8, so I'm from the northern portion of Alberta. Uh, we're about 40 minutes west of the town of Slave Lake. Uh, I grew up in my community, so... Um, you know, I walked with my grandparents, I, I walked with my grandfather, I remember, you know, I was talking earlier this week to another, another forum, and I said, I remember walking as a child and my grandfather showing me different things. You know, if you get lost in the bush, this is what you do, and this is what you need to know. And this is how you tell the direction uh, by just the nature around you. Uh, and this is common for a lot of Indigenous people. Um, and it, you know, I just assumed that everybody had this type of knowledge, you know, I was like, oh, everybody's grandparents does, does this, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it, it, as growing up, I, I just looked at it, and that was our worldview, was understanding what was around us, how do we, and, you know, when you survive off the land, how do you um, make sure the animals are there, or understand their migration patterns, or how do you um, understand where we pick medicines and, and berries and food, and, and how do you make sure that uh, you have enough for the winter, or for fishing, or hunting, those type of things. And, uh, you know, my gra- you know, I kind of laughed about this earlier this week, because I said, uh, you know, my grandfather made sure I didn't get lost in the bush, and my dad was smart enough not to let me travel too far. Um, because, you know, those are the type of things is you need to kind of understand your surroundings. Uh, my mom is from Salish, so it's on Vancouver Island, the West Coast. And what's interesting there is I have a lot of relatives uh, that know how to read the water, that can read the ocean, and this is common with uh, Indigenous people. And uh, I was visiting with one of my cousins, and he told me, he said, it's really interesting because the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, um, they would go and, and they would try to teach their, their captains how to navigate through the waters. And he said, I, I sat on the shore just kind of watching these people and, and laughing because it was <laughs> notorious. They always end in the rocks. And so finally he goes, uh, you know, they got tired of him laughing from the shore, and they said, well, if you think you're so smart, then why don't you come show us how to do it? And he goes, oh, yeah, well, I could. And then they said, no, like, we're, we're being serious. So he goes, oh, okay. So he gets in the boat, and he shows me, and he said, this is how you don't end up in the rocks. And he goes, I said, well, what happened? He goes, I didn't end up in the rocks. <laughs> so I was like, I said, well, that makes sense, right? Uh, you know, we're utilizing our knowledge, our traditional knowledge of the, the land and of the water and, and looking at that forward. Um, you know, one of the things that I always look at as well is that, um, you know, now that we have Trudeau in, in government, uh, I think one of his mandate letters says that no relationship is more important than that with the Indigenous people of Canada. And um, it's all fabulous and everything. And so now you have a lot of people pushing and saying, well, we want to be close to Indigenous people. We think we should include you. You know, we're included in more photo ops and people think, oh, this is great, look, everybody loves Indigenous people now, and I kind of said, okay, well, nothing's really changed to this point, and, you know, if we sit here waiting, uh, we could wait for, you know, Canada's 150 years now, we could wait for another 150 for things to change for our people, or we could change it ourselves. Um, You know, Jay had mentioned my daughter, uh, she's 16 right now, she wants to be a hydrogeologist. And the reason she wants to be a hydrogeologist is because um, in a, my community, you can't drink the, the, the water. You don't have access to safe drinking water. And she said, uh, you, you know, almost as long as you've been alive, you've had this boil water advisory. The water's not safe. So if the government isn't going to fix it, and, the, you know, and everybody around is just watching this and letting it happen, uh, the only person I could see fix this for myself is, is me, because I'm interested in this. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the balance of using modern science and the people who have access and the knowledge of contaminated water, and how do we find alternative sources, and marrying that with the traditional knowledge of Indigenous people, and then finding a solution for our communities that works for, for all. I, I could go on, but I'm one of those people that you've noticed that I could talk about another minute. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 
<laughs> well, and, and I, th- I think one of those things that when we start looking at it, um, as it evolves, evolves in, in the inclusion of traditional knowledge, um, one of the other things that I caution a lot of people, and I caution the speech as well, is, and I've told the Canadian government in numerous forms, is there also needs to be a protection around the knowledge holders, the people who hold this knowledge. Um, I would say that we have um, elders, but we also have old people, so let's not confuse the two. Um, everybody ages. It doesn't mean that they're a knowledge holder. Uh, for some of our cases, because we've been con- continuously attacked here in Canada of uh, who we are, they've tried to uh, remove our identity, they've tried to remove who we are as people, they've tried to, uh, they've attacked and tried to assimilate us into Canadian society. A lot of the, the cases is that we do have that break with some of our people. Um, one of the other things that you also need to realize is that we do have those knowledge holders. The ceremonies, you know, I, I was talking earlier and giving a story about how I was helping a community in Ontario um, on their orphan oil and gas bus. And I've been there for five years, and one of the elders said, he looked at me and he goes, well, I've seen you around here. And I said, yes, you've seen me around here. Because it seems as though you hear lots. And I said, Sometimes it feels like I'm here in your community more than I'm in my own, which is okay because there's work that I need to do here. Um, so why do you ask? <laughs> because he looked at me and he goes, do you know the spot that we're standing on right at this moment? And I smiled and I said, yeah. Was, and I gave him all the technical information around, well, I'm like, this is near the water and this is what they did around here and the development that took place. And he looks at me and he goes, yeah, no, that's not what I was asking. <laughs> so I smiled and I said, okay, then I'm not making the connection that you were so can you, but what, what am I missing? And he looked at me, he smiled and he said, um, when, we, when our ceremonies were outlawed, this is the point where we came to um, ensure we remembered who we were, that everybody in the community had that connection to our ceremonies. And this is where they went underground to. So you're fixing a very sacred spot for our community. And every time I tell the story, it gives me chills down my spine because I'm sitting there and this is, this is why I got into the work that I do is to um, remind people that um, Indigenous people are strong. We, we should remember that we come from strong nations, that we were built in this country, this country was built off us, that our knowledge of the furs, our knowledge of that, we were entrepreneurs, uh, we were standing nations before everybody else came to us. And it, this is something that I've, I've connected with uh, numerous indigenous people from around the world. And once we realize that, once we connect that and remember who we are and not try to um, give up a sense of us, you can find that balance where you use um, Western ideologies, philosophies, but also marry that with remembering who you are as Indigenous people moving forward. So, that is my minute. Thank you. <laughs> Until quite recently, Karen McPherson was uh, a member of the legislature, the Alberta legislature, a member of the, well, she's still a member of the legislature. <laughs> But she is now an independent member rather than being a member of the uh, New Democratic Party. Uh, and she's been, she brings a lot of, just because she left two or three days ago, doesn't mean she doesn't have a lot of, it's yeah, right. I had to change my intro. Um, she has been a member of several standing committees in the Alberta legislature, but she's also, before her political career, uh, has been really active in, in industrial uh, settings, chemical manufacturing, oil and gas, and she's been a judge at the Calgary uh, Youth Science Fair for the last seven years. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I, Cheryl, I grew up outside of Grand Prairie. We're almost neighbors. Yes. Um, yeah, I grew up in a little town outside of Grand Prairie. It was a, a farming town. And something that struck me when thinking about tonight was that farmers are the ultimate people in a, a micro version of sustainability. It's really important for farmers to be able to uh, continue to use the land. And um, it, it struck me also that there's a, a modicum of what might be called as common sense. And the further we get away from being on the land, the further away I think we are from 
actually having a good understanding day to day what sustainability means in in our lives. Um, and I, like talking about tonight, what I really want to talk about is changing behaviors through public education and and how that can be achieved. Um, knowledge translation. So before I became an MLA, I worked as a business analyst for a number of years. And what I did as a business analyst was I would take business requirements, I would go to the technical people, and I would have a conversation with them to explain what these business requirements meant. And then I would take the information from the technical people back to the business people and translate to them, okay, in the technology realm, this is what you're capable of doing, this is how it meets your needs, this is how we can come up with solutions for what you're doing. And I think that's a lot of what we're trying to achieve when we're talking about educating the public, making science more accessible for people, and essentially meeting people where they are with the information that's going to make a difference um, in, in their behavior, because it's a change of behavior that changes the outcomes. Um, and there's no one way to do this. I think, like with any good problem solving, it's an integrated approach that needs to be taken. It's really difficult to come up with a, an elegant or robust solution when you work in isolation. When when work is done in silos, we lose the benefit of the perspectives of other stakeholders that could really contribute to better solutions and more sustainable solutions for sustainability. So uh, I did a little bit of research, and um, I think I forgot to mention when I was in high school, I was the only girl in the computer club. Um, and um, yeah, so that's where my my uh, my desire, my joy in science, I think it originated then. And I also had a neighbor when I was a little girl. So the town I lived in was called Sexsmith, Alberta. There were 300 people. And my neighbor, his name was George Robinson, and he had um, two big sheds in his backyard that looked like uh, museums when you went inside of them. He had fossils, he had bugs on sticks, he had skeletons of animals I'd never heard of. And that really made a big difference to me, like really sparking my interest in science and it's something that um, has stayed with me my whole life. And I think a lot of young girls miss out on that op opportunity. Um, so what, what other ways can we make it more accessible to, to girls in particular, but society in general? And again, it's back to that point of meeting people where they're at. So some examples that I came across, um, there's an organization in my writing called COST, C-A-W-S-T, uh, Center for Affordable Water and Sanitation Technology. And what they do is they go to um, underdeveloped countries and they help communities uh, come up with solutions to um, take care of their water and sanitation needs. And a lot of the materials that they've developed uh, for this work, they'll go and they'll train people who aren't scientists to do this work, and they'll use infographics. So infographics are a really accessible way. It's like it's like the IKEA version of building a tree, and um, it's it's really easy to understand. And they'll have a picture where um, having the latrine up from the water source, there's a big X to it. Like, don't do that. That's going to spoil your water source. Having a latrine down from your level, well, yes, you can do that. There's a green check mark, and it makes it really easy for people to understand uh, the science behind it. They don't have to have any technical training to know that, oh, that's a good idea, that's not a good idea. Um, um, I'm trying to think of some other examples. Films and documentaries, animations are other ways that um, I've come across in meeting the kinds of people that I am lucky enough to meet in my work. Um, and I was speaking to someone who has done some research in Mexico about, um, it's, it's around accessibility of information. And he was talking about a project where they were trying to communicate information about spreading STDs and AIDS and how to prevent the spread of those disease. And what they did was they came up with um, radio soap operas. So I guess these programs are quite popular with people who do a lot of field work. They'll listen to this, uh, to these soap operas while they're working. And they worked this information into the story and they just met the people where they were. They didn't try to explain things on a level that was inaccessible to them. And it was very successful. It had a really good impact. Um, it, it had the kind of outcome that they were that they were looking to do. 
So, um, in my role as an MLA, putting this into context, um, you have to consider well, what role can government play in making science more accessible? Um, you know, besides providing uh, basic education that includes a robust science curriculum, um, developing policies that support sustainability. And an example of this in Alberta is uh, the carbon tax. So the idea is to reduce the amount of carbon that is released into the atmosphere and using a tax in order to encourage people to change their behavior. Um, and something else that governments can do is measuring the effects of climate change. So it's great to have a policy, but where do we stand now? And what kind of measures can we use to um, confirm that the policies that are being implemented are having the effect that they want that that we want them to have? It? And if they're not having the effect that is intended, then do something about that. Adjust the policy to have the sort of outcome that you're looking for. Um, public education. So utilizing best practices, use, using some of those methods that I was talking about earlier in order to reach people. Um, um, and um, I have an example from Alberta Park. So in Kananaskis country, they're out in the Bull Valley, there's an amphitheater. And what they do is they get their staff to, uh, to dress up as beavers and bears. And, and they put on plays. And they're actually musicals. And they're very popular with families. And they talk about conservation. And it, it has a, a huge impact. Like, it, it really resonates, especially with, with children, um, and really brings the message across. And I think probably the most important thing that any government can do is collaborate with other jurisdictions. And again, I think that speaks back to an integrated approach to problem solving because we in Canada, while we have specific uh, challenges that we're facing on a, on a more general level, what we're facing is being faced all over the world. And the more that we're able to collaborate, to talk to other jurisdictions, the more robust um, solutions, the more sustainable solutions we can come up with. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I trust and I hope that we have a discussion about climate change and communication at some point tonight because um, if people don't want to hear your message, it doesn't matter how skillfully you deliver it. And when it comes to climate change, that's been so abundantly demonstrated that you can, you know, you can do anything. But if people don't want to hear your message, they will not hear it. And I think this is one of this is a problem in Canada and all of the Americas. Lots of people have um, their own reasons for not wanting to believe what climate change is like. Uh, so let's hope that uh, that comes up. And our last speaker, Mel Wilson, didn't object to being the last because he said that the name was like the W. He's always the last. Uh, He's from PEI, Canada's smallest but one of the most beautiful provinces. Endless red beaches, uh, ocean rising ocean levels, properties for sale. Uh, he's been living in Calgary since the late 80s, so he has two interdisciplinary degrees, which suits him very well for this audience, as the topic is interdisciplinary. Um, he specializes in environmental and sustainability auditing. He was national leader of the sustainable business solutions practice at PricewaterhouseCoopers Canada, but he's now started his own consulting business. Yeah. Thanks, Jake. Thanks to all the other speakers. Uh, just as a comment, uh, uh, Don, I, was, I, I started my career as, a, as an ecologist, and I wasn't very good at it, so I uh, moved on. Um, so, all the all these speakers' uh, comments uh, were actually kind of relevant to what I was planning to say. I mean, this what this hasn't been rehearsed, so I didn't know what they were going to talk about. Um, so I'm going to do I'm going to start by doing a little uh, uh, mental exercise for all of you. So the premise here is that we all see the world differently. We all personally have a lens that has formed over the years, 
part of, part of, part of it's from genetics, but part of it's from what we experience and what we learn in schools and what we learn from our community and what we learn from our elders and so forth. So we all have a different lens that we look through when we look at the world. And it, to give you just a mental exercise of what that would be like, imagine if we passed around to everybody sitting here a blank sheet of paper and a pencil. And we told each of you to make a sketch of what you think about when you think about today's world. Chances are we will all sketch something different. Now, the reason why we would all sketch something different is because we all have different views. We have different priorities, we have different experiences, and so forth. And that's part of the challenge when we talk about communications, whether it's science or some other area, is that if we are if we are only coming at it from our world, our view of the world, we're clashing with other people's view of the world. And so it takes a lot of time to to, to for everybody to change their lens so that it's similar. So what do you do? Well, uh, this, this is, being here tonight is kind of serendipity because I had a, I had another meeting earlier this week with a student from the University of Toronto who was in town at a conference, and they were talking about what can students do uh, to I guess, play a role in dealing with climate change. And so we had a good conversation, and one of the, one of the things that came out of it was first off that when you think of science. We often think of uh, you know people in lab coats, uh, people out with uh, groups on the field, and they have you know smarty pants PhDs, and they get all the uh, expensive equipment, and they're doing all these measurements and tests. And that's that is part of science. There's no doubt about it. But that doesn't have to be all there is to science. So what? So picture this. Imagine if we created a program across Canada, and we engaged with the youth, uh, not just in urban areas and in schools, but in rural communities as well, and indigenous communities. And we said, we're going to get you to help us. The, the view is, is that the climate is changing, and we have lots of expensive programs and satellites that uh, measure atmospheric changes and stuff. But what if we got the people in the community to go out and do regular measurements of things that don't require a degree to do? So picture this. So imagine you have a community and there's, there's a lake in the community, a river in the lake. And you have a couple of meters, uh, flow meters, levels, shows of the, of the river levels. Uh, the lake freezes over in the winter time. So, what if you got the community to come together and say, okay, uh, we're going to have these measurements on the river, we're going to track them daily. So, on Mondays, Bob's going to go down, he's going to have a ledger and record the date and the level of the, uh, the water. Tuesday, Susan's going to go down, and she's going to do the same. And then Wednesday's back to Bob, and so on and so forth. And so, you have sort of a built in quality assurance. It's unlikely that Bob's going to fudge any numbers knowing that Susan's going to come tomorrow and, and check. If there's a wild swing in the water level, well, you have other people that come down and verify to look at it. You say, look, it went up five inches from yesterday. And now we have grandmothers and kids and leaders of the, of the community witnessing this and verifying it, signing off. That's on the river level. Imagine having a lake. And every, uh, every winter, the lake freezes over. So what we do is we take a 50-pound weight with a long rope and a buoy on the end. We stick it at a certain point on the ice, and we start measuring how what gate does that weight walk through the ice. And so every day, somebody goes down, checks it, and says, yeah, no, it's still standing, still standing, still standing. And then on April 2nd, it crashes through. And so you call the community, you get three or four people come down and witness it. Yep, it went through. That data, that, that sort of 
simple data that virtually anybody could do is important. Good data will always find a home. And so imagine you have a community doing this. And they're going out and they're checking when's the first time we see the geese fly over? What's the earliest date? And what date do we see the, bo- the flowers come into bloom? And what date do we see the first mosquito? And so on and so forth. And you track this, and you track this for 25 years. Now we have a history. And it's not just an oral history, we have information that's been verified by the community. So the community is all in agreement with that. This, these changes are happening. And maybe some communities are experiencing greater change than others. Well, that's important information for governments. So now we have the communities engaged. They own that information. So if they own the information, they can send it to you know, some of the uh, high school students or university students from that community that know their way around databases and Excel spreadsheets. You have your smarty pants grandson type it into an Excel spreadsheet. And once a year, you bring the whole community together and you put on a presentation. And the people sitting in the room will say, I own that data. I own it. I was part of that. I verified that. So now they own part of science. So then the discussion can turn to let's not, we don't have to argue over whether the data is good or not. We all agree it's good. So the question is, what's it telling us? How do we interpret it? And maybe that's where you involve some trained scientists to come in. But, you know, you don't have to be a PhD to, to read some of this simple data to see that things are changing. It's like the old song. You don't have to be a weatherman to know which way the wind's blowing. So you can, you can do it, and you can involve you. The communities can have uh, it's set up so that Every year you go through this, and once a year the government issues a scholarship to the community that has the most volunteers involved. Right? It could work. And it could be a way of getting the youth interested in the issue. Oh, you can, uh, <laughs> we're not lazy. <laughs> uh, so, so that's. So that's uh, a way of involving the community. So let's bring it back to where I started. We all have this different view of the world. And that different view is often qualitative. But science is a combination of qualitative information and quantitative information. So picture the old Venn diagrams where you have two circles overlapping. And you've got qualitative information and you've got quantitative data. And where they overlap, is the common ground. That's where you can involve the community, that's where you can involve the scientists, and they can come together, and it doesn't have to be scientifically, you know, published papers that the data is based on. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. It can be community-based. It can be youth-based. You bring it, your people together, the common ground is how do we interpret this data that is relevant to our lives and where we want to go as a community. So think about that. I'll end there. Thanks, so, Bill. Um, there are going to be two more closing announcements, but we're still not leaving. So you can just ignore them. So, you know, there's a, an incredible and uh, interesting diversity of ideas here. I would say now, if I had to put it in a phrase, might be citizen science, not unlike uh, what Don said, in uh, respecting indigenous knowledge and uh, communicating better uh, at many levels. So my question, both to the panel, well, I'm going to phrase it differently, but I want to ask all of you, especially those of you who are attending the conference, do you know of examples from wherever you come from where this is starting to happen? Because what I really want to get at is, these are all great ideas, but who's going to kick it off? You know, who is, what government, if I can just pick government for a minute, what government is going to encourage these kinds of practices? Because I think these are all good ideas. They all will require very careful communication, but set that aside for a minute. So if anybody knows of a, an example where the populace uh, is involved in gathering data that might actually get to decision makers, I'd like to hear that from any of you. 
or from any of you. Yes. So, do you want to go there? Okay. And actually, do we do we have a microphone? We don't have a microphone for the audience, right? So, you're just going to have to. Yes, speak up. Um, It'll be good for the court. I was going to answer that uh, question. No <laughs> savior, yeah, no but does anybody have a comment on that on her question? So, absolutely, you're right. Um, citizen science and people um, observing and different ways of knowing and local knowledge and indigenous knowledge, they're there. The question is, how do we connect everything? Um, just make two comments about that. Number one is we have the internet, which uh, I keep telling students is nothing more than a gigantic encyclopedia. When I was little, my parents had Encyclopedia Britannica at home, and you would look things up, or I would go to the public library. Now you can, the, the information is there. But when people go on the internet to look things up, 99.99% of people do not go beyond page one of their Google results. They just see what's there in the, the top two or three. That's why what you really want to do if you have to, quote, clean up your internet um, uh, footprint, if you posted some pictures of yourself partying or something, you just have to post a lot more pictures of yourself doing citizen science and get your friends to like them a lot, and then that will come up on page one because nobody goes to page three. So, so we are we are data rich, but knowledge poor. So our challenge is how to have people be curious and think critically and uh, ask those questions. And I think that for that, you have to have ongoing dialogue, like the kind of experience you had with your grandfather and working with elders and having those intergenerational uh, conversations which we may have lost and we need to put get that back. That's really valuable. And then as to the second point about why can't academics do this? Well, frankly, until quite recently, um, when academics are hired, researchers in universities, 
got very, very few brownie points in our tenure and promotion files for doing uh, public outreach and science communication and the stuff like that. It's discouraged. It's not a, a generally, it's discouraged. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, few, few, well I, I did it anyway, and I still managed to get tenure. But I did get in my tenure and promotion letter from the president the comment, you've done all this service and community work and committee work. That's very strange. I mean, there was a comment, not that's a good thing. You've raised the profile and talked about sheep and stuff on the radio when people think grass is interesting, but interesting that you did that. Um, I think that culture is shifting. Um, it's actually shifting actually by design. Uh, there are, um, is an increasing number of academics who believe that public science and citizen engagement is really essential. I'm happy to say it's a lot of my, my female colleagues were pushing for this because this is the way that we're going to diversify who is at that table. So this is a really, really big push, and, and it is coming from 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 the, that that um, that sector is building, and social media is allowing us to network. So we are actually harnessing the power of the internet, but nevertheless we will remain data rich but knowledge poor, and that is our challenge. The other thing I would say to that is. Um, what I find with academia is they like to outsmart some. You want to be the smartest in the room. So you use these big words, and in using the big words, the only people who know um, how to communicate with you are those doctors. So I deal with a lot of engineers who always want to be the smartest in the room and puff their chest out and say, look at me, I'm so wonderful. And I always say, okay, well, can you communicate that concept to a person in grade six? And they look at you and they go, well, why would I want to do that? And it's like, okay, they're the next generation coming up. We have a lot of baby boomers here, especially in Canada, that are aging out of their, their professions. And if you can't transmit that knowledge, it's going to be lost with you. If you don't um, talk about what you know and mentor youth and, and other people, then what you're going to find is that, um, you know, it's inevitable. Everybody dies. That knowledge will die with you. Um, and then what good is the work that you've dedicated your entire life if there, <laughs> what what you know what what point has that done if, if nobody else knows what you've done? Um, so you know with the engineering concepts and all of those in the energy sector specifically, those are things that I've worked with. Going okay, dumb it down to me. Talk to me like I'm a child. And they go, well, why do you want that? And I'm like, well, you're not a child. And it's like, well, you need to be able to communicate. So I've talked about all of these um, super technical things, and I said, when I'm sitting in the room. What my role is and what my job is, is to take your super technical talk and have it so that the average Canadian, the average farmer, First Nation, youth, child, understands what you're talking about. Because if you can get them to cry, then they want to be engaged with you. Uh, you know, I have, uh, we were talking about sea turtles and it made me smile, but it made me think of my youngest. You know, she finds all of these different things and I look at her and I go, what makes you interested about that? She goes, I heard something and I felt connected to it, so I want to tell everybody about it. And she, she's in grade six, so she does presentations about sea turtles and jaguars, and I'm going, okay, fantastic, <laughs> sure, this is, this is great, but, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here going, this is your interest, and I need to, as your parent, as a person who wants to see you grow as a person, we need to mentor that, and, and you know, if you want to do a presentation, you want to research it, let's find critical sources to go and help. The internet is, is great, I say to my kids, you can research all you want, but stay off of Wikipedia, stay off all of these things that don't have scientific knowledge. So if you're putting the information out on the internet, make sure that you're not over technical, making the, the information over technical, because then you lose a lot of people and you lose a lot of interest and the impact you think you have and you won't necessarily have unless a person has a close doctor, which is then pointless because they already know about your topic anyway. So. You know, um, so I've been in um, I've been to be a good science communicator for 40 years, and um, I find that I keep moving further and further away from science and more and more into what scientists would call entertainment. And uh, as soon as I have a microphone, I'm going to give you a very quick example. So I um, and my partner started a, an event in 
probably called Beaker Hill. And it is a mix of art, science, and engineering. Our only goal is to entertain people. If we think if people come to Beakerhead and are delighted, they will come back. This year we had an amazing structure built by a group of women in San Francisco who call themselves the Flaming Lotus Girls. And it, it's a welded serpent, huge, um, 125 feet long or something, propane flames all over the place. Uh, spe- absolutely spectacular. And I heard about a five-year-old girl who was absolutely riveted by this thing, this serpent. It's called Serpent Mother. And it's because there's a metallic egg that it's curled around. And every once in a while, the egg opens and there's some, probably a hundred foot propane flame. Propane is entertaining. <laughs> uh, but when she was going home with her mother, she said, where is Serpent Mother going to sleep tonight? Okay, now that's not science, but she's intrigued. And if she were, and I saw this happen with many kids, if the kids go up when the flames are down and ask the builders to explain it, they'll explain it, they'll let them push a button to create a flame. All you need is that spark. And so the unfortunate tendency of scientists in the past, and I, I agree with Don that it might be changing at a glacial pace, um, is to just overload them with information. But you've got to intrigue people first. And after that, you can start putting on the information. So I actually have a question back to you. Who thought about doing sea turtles as opposed to probably several other subjects that you could have done? Thank you. 
So I have to this question here. I'll use the mic here. Um, how can we better respect oral histories, indigenous knowledge? Because my sense is that I'm sure I've heard of things like, oh, you know, it's amazing. They actually saw this hundreds of years ago, as if that should be surprising. And there's an attitude change that I would think has to happen, but I'd like to hear what you all think. So, go ahead. Um, yeah, the, so the area I grew up in, in Eastern Canada, it was the same. There was a lot of uh, or, oral inf- information was passed on orally from generation to generation in farms and, and uh, you know, fishermen and, and everything. And the information was taken as, uh, as long as the community generally agreed on it, it was considered that was good enough. Um, and if somebody kind of strayed off the community of understanding, they were brought back in. And it was sort of, well, you know, it was kind of a consensus based understanding. It wasn't just each family had their own version of uh, events. Uh, I, with the, I think what's where we, where we're at today is when we're especially talking about something like climate change, which is, which is incremental. Uh, it's going to end up with a lot of people saying, this is not how it used to be. So, so a lot of the historical information that used to be passed from generation to generation is suddenly confronted with a new reality. Uh, the way we used to do things doesn't seem to work anymore. But if you can engage the, going back to my little story about the community, if you engage the community in those really, really simple measurements, as I was saying, like don't just observe and try to remember the last time you saw a, a snowfall. Like we had a snowfall on Monday, right? And a lot of people uh, who were 25 or younger would say, geez, that seems really early. Um, but if you talk to somebody who's 80 years old, they say, yeah, it happens all the time. Well, you're going to have this bouncing back and forth. And how do you resolve it? Well, you resolve it by having agreed upon information. And to Don's point about data rich and information poor, it's absolutely. There's, there's reams of, of data. Well, data is just basically uh, information that's been collected and because it was related to somebody's uh, research experience and they prepped it. And there's a lot of people doing that all over the place. But if there's a way of turning that data into information, and that's basically the, the role of a, of, a, of a community scientist, is to say, this is uh, how we should interpret this. If we see uh, this, the trend going this way, we know that something's going on. And if it extrapolates, if it continues, this is likely what we'll encounter. But if it's purely qualitative, you end up with a lot of people saying, well, that's not how I remember it. That's not what I recall. You do need some data. And if you have the community owning the data, they feel part of the answer as well, or they own part of the answer as well. So I'll somewhat disagree with that, uh, specifically because as it applies to to traditional knowledge, um, our our knowledge keepers, um, it's it's not anybody who could tell a story. Um, the, The information is held um, and it's transmitted in certain experiences and the way that we see our knowledge is very sacred. Um, so uh, we've had a lot of our cases in our history, um, academics, um, and I'm, again, painting a stroke on that, uh, come into our communities, uh, meet with our elders, meet with our knowledge keepers, take the information away, put it in a book and say, wow, isn't this fantastic? This is our research and we were able to do it. With no mention to the indigenous people, no mention to the indigenous knowledge where it came from, or a recognition to um, everything as it compiles together. That's why I always talk about the protection of our people, uh, the protection around our knowledge keepers, um, because anybody who deals a lot with traditional knowledge will know that. Um, for the example, or the question you asked a little bit long ago about um, good examples is we have culture camps. This is one way that we can transmit our knowledge in our area um, to people within our community, p- to people who want that relationship, to want to understand our world perspectives. Um, you know, and it's done in numerous communities. Um, you know, 
point to lots at, at different times uh, during the summer, typically. Um, we also have, uh, there's a high school, I can't remember which one specifically, I have to find out, um, that has the culture camp for those people or, or for those uh, families that are on the land uh, to say, okay, well, let's recognize the fact that we know at this certain time you're going to go hunting because you need to provide food for your family. Um, so let's put that and wrap that into a credit um, so that you're not just absent, you're actually transmitting the knowledge or gaining knowledge that will help you feed your family. Uh, so there's there's lots of ways that you can kind of go about doing it. I'm always, um, you know, when it comes to community knowledge, um, I'm always making sure that communities are aware that they are owner that they have ownership over it. Sub academics are very good at making sure that the ownership of any knowledge of our people is left in the communities. Um, but the side effect is there are a lot of or some um, academics who want to take it for themselves so that they can be that expert in that area. So I, I'd like to be like a, a little cautious as it comes to traditional knowledge and incorporating indigenous people in there because we do transmit our, our information orally. Um, those are sacred ways of doing it. When I went through university um, and I was learning about indigenous history from a Canadian historian, one of the things that he said to me was, he goes, this is all great and everything that you people, and meaning indigenous First Nations people, but you people think that you can, you have your own history, it's, it's all fantastic, but let's, let's be realistic. If you sit in a circle and you start at the beginning, by the time you get to the end, it's going to be a completely different history. So let's not kid ourselves about um, treasuring something that really isn't back to be treasured. Um, of course, I'm a vocal person, so I stood up in the class and I told them, I said, let's, let's, let's be realistic here. You don't know anything about First Nations people, so let's do the whole class a favor, skip over First Nations because you know nothing about us, and let's talk about the French or <laughs> the Acadians or things like that. Uh, he looked at me and he kind of shook his head and goes, oh God, what did I get myself into? But the problem is, is that after he had me in his class, it didn't change his perspective. He still held on to that, saying, uh, you know, and I talked to someone a couple of years later who had taken his class, and they said, yeah, they said, did you see, did you ever have this teacher? He said this, and I went, did you challenge him? And they said, well, no, I sat quietly. I'm like, that's the problem. When we sit quietly in his classes and we don't challenge those perspectives, then they get continued on from year to year, and people think that that's okay. And it shouldn't be okay. We shouldn't allow it to be okay. Actually, we shouldn't realize that history is written by the victors, and it may not represent what really happened anyway. Okay. Um, I just wanted to add that there seems to be a disconnect between the institutions in our societies and the values of some of our parts of societies. And so things like an oral history is not valued by an academic institution or government. And, and going about changing those things is a matter of continually having conversations and exposing people to the information, eventually it will stick. Um, and it's also a matter of pressuring elected officials and bureaucrats, continuing the pressure, continuing the education of them to make sure that eventually those institutions do shift and they do start to reflect the values of more people. You know, uh, while you have the microphone uh, and you are closest to government of all of us, um, climate change, it, it, it is apparent, uh, at least in the U.S. And, and to a degree in Canada, that no matter how much data or how much indigenous knowledge all summed up together, that's not really the issue. The issue is not the data. The issue is the economy. And, you know, if we take steps, I, I obviously I'm not speaking of every political party, mm -hmm. but clearly, uh, from the reactions today to the cancellation of the pipeline, uh, climate change, that, that's not, it's, it's about jobs. And so, um, all that does, I think, is underline the challenge that we all have, not only in generating the information, not only in translating it so that uh, everybody understands it, but in actually persuading people that it's important enough to act. That's a huge challenge. And um, the aspect of politics comes into it, and it's, um, it's our democratic 
systems, I think, that, that bear some of that responsibility. It's almost like a large corporation that is looking to the next quarter and their shareholder returns rather than the longer term impact. And with governments, what I've, what I've seen is that, you know, there's a four year cycle through elections and that tends to inform more policy than I believe it should, or it will it will cause a hesitancy to act in a in a more um, transformative way, if that makes sense, uh, to to take action that would have a, a larger impact. And honestly, I think what it comes down to is fear. Like, there's a lot of fear that is around these conversations about the economy and and. It seems like it's easier to control the way people vote by scaring the crap out of them, and rather than giving them realistic information about what what our prospects are, what's going to happen if we do this or if we do not do this in the long term. Um, and it, it, yeah, but I don't know how to answer that question. It's part of why I stepped away and be, being in a caucus is because those polarized conversations really don't don't lead us to any solutions. Is there anyone in the audience who can give us a perspective on how climate change is viewed by the government in their country? It's okay, you're allowed to speak to us. <laughs> I don't remember they didn't get that together, you know? And so, um, so the, for the decade between 2000 and 2010, we had uh, so much of the product of so much wine and, and, and landslides and, and hundreds of people killed and thousands of people protected. And, 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 uh, and so the, the only one who came out of the whole situation is a position for the whole country that we get. So we have to have a lot of the other people I think you make a really good point, and I remember seeing some research about places in the world where there would be more impact, and Canada is not going to be impacted to the same degree as countries um, from another continent. <coughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Well, some parts of Canada. Yes, yes. But we don't have a lot of people in it. 
and that I, I, t- I take your point. <laughs> and, but that's always the comment that we get is, you know, um, there's not a lot of people, so, you know, there is going to be an impact to our north to our ice. There already is that. We talk to, talk to the Inuit and the northern people, and that's what they talk about is that how do we start dealing with a lot of the, the you know, the fact that we used to go hunting on the ice and now we can't because it's too thin. Um, how do you start um, making sure that the livelihood that we've had for generations is, is continued? And it's similar to those type of things, the extreme weather. Um, so, you know, I always say I'm born in January, and I remember always getting the day off. My, my birthday, I always got the day off because I was always 40, 45 below. And I was super excited. I'm like, yes, yes. My birthday's coming up, so I get a day off school. Um, but, you know, those are those type of things as you start seeing the, the weather patterns and how things um, approach them. And I think South America has some really um, great environmental things that you guys are, are doing that is different than anywhere else in the world. Um, you know, I look at, at Ecuador, at Bolivia, I had the foreign minister of foreign affairs from Bolivia come and speak to uh, my conference about the law of Mother Earth and some of the exciting things that are happening in South America. Uh, this year I had Argentina come and speak to us. They're doing things like pipeline conference that are pipeline put that goes through numerous indigenous communities. So we want to talk about what they're doing that's engaging in the indigenous space. Um, but those are some, some things that I think um, from what I've looked at uh, the North from North America can really uh, understand and, and get some benefits from what's happening in the southern southern hemisphere. I, I don't think we do that enough. I think we like to say uh, Canada's this bubble where the where the best look at us where we're where, where, um, we're fantastic, and, you know, within our own little country, sure. Um, but if you include Indigenous people, then we're not so fantastic. Um, but I think those are things that we can start looking at. We are leaders in certain areas, and we are um, out and, and, and looking at different things. And I think that's where we need to have that perspective, is that we have a lot to learn, but we also have a lot to teach, and there needs to be that reciprocity as it comes to knowledge in the scientific area. So, so actually, um, things are very good in Canada, particularly if you're an Inuit, um, an Inuk, I should say, because the Inuit are the are the people. Um, so, so Sheila Watt Coutier, who uh, was nominated for a Nobel Prize the year that Al Gore won it, of course, has um, uh, brought forward Canada to the United Nations. Um, to uh, as as they and, and has argued for the right to be called and has presented the case that uh, we are not doing things well at all. And I've spent a lot of time in the last two years in the high Arctic, um, traveling with with um, Inuit uh, culturalists and politicians and people. And most recently, with actually Phil Fontaine um, was was with us. The former. Uh, Grand Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. He hadn't spent that much time um, in the Arctic and was uh, very interested to dialogue with the Inuit. So um, things are aren't great for us. Uh, ice ice sheets are melting. I've now been in um, on Baffin and in Devon Island, where you can see these sheets are 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 are, um, are receding. And this is not good for the culture. This is actually not necessarily good for the wildlife. There's all kinds of uncertainties. And let me talk about United Nations. About the United, so you were asking about the stories. In fact, one of the things I would say that the United Nations um, Conference of the Parties, the, the climate change meetings, they've done amazing work in bringing forward the stories of youth and indigenous people. You can, there's an amazing collection of films where you can go on and you can really hear the stories, you can hear the lived experience, you can see if there's a lot of art that's there. They're, they're really trying to make these connections to explain what the future scenarios are if we don't act. But the thing is to get people to be aware of them. This is, this is always the issue. How do you tell the story? So now there are a lot of scientists who are actually being educated as storytellers. And, uh, and and I think if we don't do this, then all that work will, will not actually uh, be seen. And by the way, as the, uh, the, the, the air currents change, the, the Gulf Stream is going, if, it, if, if, when it, if and when it turns off, and it probably will, um, there's going to be a lot of very cold Northern European countries who are going to be experiencing the kind of conditions that they've never seen. And so many of the predictions that I used to talk about 
in my ecology courses in the 1990s. I've been teaching climate change for 30 years and the predictions of the different models and so much of that stuff is now, is, is actually happening. It really is. Why well, scientists are going to become storytellers and I do workshops for scientists, we will be working until I'm 110. <laughs> you will. Um, I wonder if there's, because uh, we're, oh, there's a comment, sorry, a couple of comments. Anybody? Well, there is a carbon tax in this province, so uh, it would be hard to say that it's nothing. Of course, in two years, if the uh, other party wins, they're adamant about getting rid of it. So. Well, and a lot of that has to do with, with uh, using fuel to, to light the light for it, or using coal for it to uh, uh, light our houses and heat our houses, and, and the development of an energy intensive resource, which is the most famous, which other provinces don't have. BC uses hydro, Manitoba uses hydro, and so forth. So, by comparison, you're, you're correct. But it's, it's in part because we're using and exploiting resources that we have that other provinces don't have. The same. What I'd have to say to that, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in there, um, is that there are some companies who are uh, looking at innovation, so this is where our innovation needs to come in. And uh, I met two weeks ago, three weeks ago, with a company that's looking at um, how do we start uh, keeping the way because agriculture takes up so much land, how do we grow our crops and how do we um, utilize 
okay, this is what we want to put scientific knowledge, but the, the living living walls and put them in warehouses and grow our own food that way rather than that we could keep it very sustainable in the sense that you have a climate that the climate is the same throughout the year no matter what, and you have a certain amount of water that you could utilize in those. So this is where um, we need to make sure that we keep up with the tech and innovation side of it as well, because they can. this is where they can uh, contribute a lot to that, to making sure that um, we do have growing populations um, in Canada, where the fastest, and the indigenous people are the fastest growing population in this country. So how do we make sure that, that with the fastest growing populations, people are going to keep um, you know, we're going to keep having people be born, so how do we make sure that they're also fed? Um, and we, we deal with, with those type of aspects as well. So uh, there is some, some innovation with people going, okay, this, this way this is past may not continue because we do have the changing climate. How do we uh, make sure that the world's population is still fed apart to, to a lot of the you know, kind of traditions and things that we have? Well, why wouldn't we want to engage them in the process as well? I mean, it's the same argument is why why wouldn't you want more women scientists instead of just one gender? I mean, two, if, if there's two genders, so it's really better to have both of them working on the problems. Mel, did you want to say something? Yeah, just a couple of points. One, one is to your remarks about, uh, <coughs> sorry, your remarks about uh, farming and so forth. I, I, I remember um, I, I, in grade Nine science, we talked about the greenhouse effect. This was in the early 80s. And so it's been around a long time. It's, it's, it's not a new concept, but you know, we're still, you know, we're still having debates about it in some, some countries. Uh, but on the farming thing specifically, I, I remember reading articles in different business magazines and whatnot. I don't remember who the authors were, but they would talk about Canada will likely benefit from climate change because A, things get a little warmer, and B, there's a bit more CO2 in the atmosphere and plants use CO2 in photosynthesis. What they overlook is that plants require more than just temperature and CO2. They require water, uh, and the water patterns will be changing. It requires soil quality, so you can't grow plants on, on top of a rock. And lastly, a lot of plants are mostly affected by the amount of sunlight they get. The sun is going to stay on the same axis as it is now. The north isn't going to get more sun. It may get warmer, but it's still going to have its same drought periods as it has now. So we're going into an experiment that we actually we don't know what's going to happen. It may be a catastrophe. Uh, but we don't know. So what happens when you have warmer temperatures, higher CO2, but the same amount of sunlight, and maybe less precipitation? It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a good thing. The last thing, uh, I just want to, just want to make a comment, and let's bring it back around where, where I kind of started, which was uh, talking about worldview and how each of us, if we did that little experiment, would probably sketch something different. And you know what? When we leave here tonight, we'd probably sketch it different again based on this, this discussion. So our worldviews are continually changing by what we hear, what we discuss, what we agree with, what we disagree with. Uh, these kind of events that we have here, this, uh, um, to, use the, to use the jargon, the multi-stakeholder event, is, is the reason why you want diversity and you want different views and uh, different genders and different cultures involved is that it breaks out of that hive of mind thinking where everybody thinks the same. Everybody draws the same picture of what the world looks like. The world isn't the same for everybody, no truth. Is. But if you want to get change, what we're often talking about is getting people to change their world view. And that's not easy. You can't do that with one discussion. It's very, very unlikely. Somebody comes in with 50 years under their belt that they've been on this earth and their education and their experience and their families and so forth, sitting down with them for 10 minutes and telling them, you're wrong, I'm right, isn't going to work. The best opportunity we probably have is, is really focusing and in investing our time and effort in, in, in youth to the youth. Okay. okay. Sorry. No, go ahead. I'm not saying anything. No, I mean, I, I'm being, I was born, I grew up in Winnipeg, I'll keep right. Um, there are a couple of people with questions, and we're actually right on our uh, supposed end time, but we have time to get those to you, so you have a question.
of things that one could say about that, but I, I would say one thing is that uh, rather than separating the arts and the sciences, uh, I think, and we're trying to do that in a tiny way here with Beakerhead, but in a much grander way, I think that that would be a healthier situation. I mean, and I'm, I don't really want to slag scientists because, you know, they, in this country they spend, what, 35% of their time writing grant requests. With a, with a success rate of 13% or something, and they teach and blah, blah, blah. So it's, you know, it's pretty hard to ask them to be, take the time to be great communicators, first of all. It's going to be even harder with the existing system to suggest that they take a, a more indigenous point of view or a more artistic point of view. But certainly smearing out the knowledge base a little bit, I think, is yeah, a good idea. Uh, you had a question at the back? Or did you just put up your hand? Go ahead. I'll take this one. <laughs> uh, when it comes to the Standing Rock situation, I think um, there's a fine balance. Um, I have had relatives who have gone down to Standing Rock. Um, I have engaged with the chairman of the Standing Rock uh, to try and get him to come and talk to um, my conference and say, let's make sure that we understand perspectives. Uh, one of the things that they always said, uh, especially for those who went to Standing Rock, was that um, you can be here to support our community, but the fight is ours. So let's just make sure that's clear. And as it applies to natural resources, a lot of the, the challenge that it gets is um, rights. So in the States, you look at and you talk about tribal sovereignty. In Canada, our rights are constitutionally protected. So it, it's a different discussion, and it's always been a different discussion, um, specifically because of Section 35 and the repatriation of the Constitution here um, in 1982. So you start looking at those, and those become kind of separate discussions, and as it applies to climate change in the states, um, we like to put everything into a dichotomy. Uh, you know, it's environment versus um, uh, the economy. And those are the only two things that are in there. Um, I think Engineers Without Borders have done a phenomenal job um, in saying these are all the things as it applies to natural resource development that are impacted. It's not just the economy. It's not just the environment. Um, and these are all the things within the spectrum that need to be realized. Um, so it becomes a... a, a I, I do these talks all the time so I could talk on this for hours. <laughs> so I'm trying to make sure I'm succinct because I know we don't have hours left. Um, but, you know, those are some of the issues that we're facing as it applies to energy. In the States, it's tribal sovereignty. In Canada, it's constitutionally protected rights. Um, so you do have a lot of nations here in Canada, as well as in the States, um, that are very um, energy-focused, I guess is the best way of putting it. Um, you've got a lot of communities here in Canada 
um, that specifically focus and align themselves with more of the environmental groups. Um, there's not one position that's better than the other. Um, I always say that I'm not an elected official within these communities, but we need to respect what those communities have to say as it applies to this. We need to realize that these communities have uh, knowledge and, and reasons and positions um, as it applies to natural resources and energy um, that works for them. And I am outsider, you know, I'm a citizen of, of my community. That's where my uh, loyalty looks at. Um, I can look at my mother's communities uh, who are very much against pipelines, LNG developments, um, and those type of things. And I respect my relatives for it. And I always say, this is not my fight. You know, I can be here to support. Um, either way, I can be there to support education. I can be there to talk to you and give you different perspectives. But I respect those pers perspectives, and you has a, have a right as an Indigenous person to hold those perspectives. And so it's it's a fine balance that um, you know, uh, especially as it applies to energy, um, that is one of the most divisive conversations in this country. Uh, I was talking about energy with women um, who are in the sector, um, and it's been fun talking about how do you include those Indigenous voices, how do you include and respect the different perspectives that are in there and realize um, that there's not one, it's a spectrum of things. And you may have one that um, puts the economy first, uh, puts jobs, um, that looks at poverty. Uh, in our communities, one of the biggest things that we have to realize is that our chiefs don't only deal with oil and gas, they deal with the social services, they deal with poverty, they deal with youth suicides, they deal with the lack of education in, in some of our youth, they deal with, um, you know, so much that, um, no offense, but the average Canadian politician doesn't have to deal with. A lot of the discussions that take place here say, um, well, the mayor of Calgary or an MLA or an MP in this country get paid a certain amount. How can we justify that for a chief? Well, if you've ever been a chief of a community, you realize you work 365 days of the year, seven days a week, there is no holiday, and you are called 24 hours a day, depending on whatever crisis you're having to deal with in your community. Uh, the average MP, the average MLA gets to turn their phone off and dead the next sleep in some cases. Uh, How does that happen? <laughs> in some cases, I was very. Um, but I think those are some of the challenges. And so it gets to be that fine balance and that fine thing. So when it comes to Standing Rock, I always say Standing Rock has the ability to, do, to stand up and say um, no um, because of the road with the pipeline. Um, and they do have quite a bit of her challenges that they've gone through in a court of appeal and things. So I do find that interesting and I'm always willing to engage. But again, that could be an hour topic that we could talk about. Um, just really yeah, quick, quick comment. I think you make a really good point, and it's something that I've noticed. I've only been in office for just over two years. And I've become really disconnected from reality, and I realize that, and I'm really not sure what to do about it. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight, and I wonder sometimes if we should change our political system so we have like specialist politicians that are experts in certain areas so that we can speak about things knowledgeably because it's it's like trying to drink from a fire hose. There's just so much information. To your point, what a chief has to deal with at all levels of politicians have to be kind of expertish on lots of different things and it's impossible. And I don't know that it really leads to the best decision making processes. Okay, so one more question, you at the back, and then I'm going to get concluding remarks from the panel. And can we make lemonade from lemons here in the situation that with global warming, what, what, what have you, is there some kind of future modeling? For example, we've got the Canadian Shield, which is not very arable. We, you know, and other pockets of land in, in, well, in similar landscapes in Siberia and, you know, the <clears throat> Lapland, what have you, is, do, you, do we re really know, have we really looked at what are the positives of, uh, if it, it goes into, you know, entropy mode here and we, we move on another 10 degrees hotter in the next, say, 50 years? Um, okay, so I'm going to say it. There is no planet B. So, 
So we're not going to be setting up stations on the moon, and Elon Musk isn't going to take us to Mars as as an escape. Uh, if you're a, a fan of Serenity and all these uh, these shows, so, okay, not going to happen. Um, in terms of the climate projection models and the scenarios. Um, yeah, the land usage, um, yeah, so we're not going to be growing bananas in Sudbury, partly because we don't have those, the soil. We may have the temperature. So, so farming and food production is going to change really, really um, drastically. And there is a huge amount of interest. We're talking about vertical agriculture, local food. Um, I'm going to say it, but GMOs and, uh, are going to be part of the genetic engineering for uh, crops that can tolerate really high temperatures. Um, and for, uh, so, oh, so the other thing, let me tell you about crops. Um, 250,000 species of plants in the world, 80% of the calories that we consume um, come from 14 species. So we're going to see, I think, a huge diversification in the foods that we eat because we're really not tapping into a lot of edible foods. Like many things are going to change. Um, the question will be whether we can um, conserve the biodiversity, the genetic variation. Things like the seed vault in Svalbard is going to become terribly, terribly important. We need to conserve as much as we possibly can to uh, give us the the the, um, the kind of uh, genetic resources that we might need to harvest. But in Canada, we are not going to be farming on the shield just simply no. because of the soils. But if your if your question was more, you know, are there as yet undiscovered things that might happen, like say when the 10 degrees Celsius warms in global temperature, uh, doing that, you know, even if you could do that study which I think would be way more speculative than data-based, who would listen to you? The climate change deniers would say, well, that's just a joke, because we know it's not even happening. Environmentalists would run away from you in a panic. So I think it's highly unlikely that anything of that, you know, outreach to say even five degrees Celsius, I just don't even really see how that um, study. But in Elon Musk's uh, defense, I'm not defending, well, I happen to think the Mars ID is kind of cool, but um, he has proposed that uh, Puerto Rico could be re electrified entirely sustainably. And, you know, we, we, need, we need guys like him. He, he'll be wrong on, you know, with a Tesla. The next Tesla version isn't getting off the assembly line fast enough, and so on and so forth. But he, he is inspirational, and it's grounded in reality. And I think we need more people like that. So I just want to go, uh, bearing in mind Mel's uh, original idea of the sketch that everyone is going to take away, I'll give all four of the panelists an opportunity to fill in that sketch, the kind of sketch you might want people to take away. But like one minute each. You can start now. See as how you're always at the end. Okay. Thank you. I get to be first. <laughs> first to the last. Um, well, I guess if I going to pull it all together, what I would recommend everybody, if you're interested at all in, in uh, this topic, whether it's climate change specifically, whether it's cultural uh, exchange of information, uh, cultural protection, so forth, there is uh, probably the best United Nations program that I have seen in a long time called the Sustainable Development Goals. It's uh, Agenda 2030. And I've been beating the drum for a couple of years now. Uh, what it is, it's, it's a set of goals. It's a bit much when you look at it first, but you give it a little time to process it. It'll, it'll sink in. It's common sense stuff. Much of what we are currently doing in this country, but we're not doing all of it. And it's a set of goals that have both qualitative and quantitative components to it. So you can measure and track how are we doing against the goals. And if you want to do one thing tonight or tomorrow, uh, based on, on my talk at least, is take a few minutes and Google UN Sustainable Development Goals. 
this is what this is going to be the the pathway for the next generation. Certainly, the people graduating today, their careers in this sustainability field are going to be driven by achieving those goals. I'll, uh, I'll use that as a segue, and I'm going to pitch two things. So first of all, the Calgary Youth Science Fair, they look for judges every year. People in Calgary who are interested in uh, science, please go Thanks be a judge. I'm still, we're selling our house in Brad Creek. And then what Mel was saying about uh, the Sustainable Development Goals in Calgary, there's Together 2017. Um, it's a conference, a two-day conference in Calgary that talks about Sustainable Development Goals. So if you're in Calgary, um, it is October 23rd and 24th. Maybe check it out and uh, might might give you a, a lot better grounding in, in what those goals are. And thanks very much for having me tonight. Um, for what I would say, I guess to kind of pull everything together is put your investment into your youth. Um, I am currently engaged uh, with the Alberta Women and Science Network to increase awareness and increase uh, Indigenous students in the field of science. Um, I'm also engaged with Junior Achievement uh, for our inner city Aboriginal kids so that they can understand and see the, the world of business. Um, I keep saying that I'm going to pretty soon hopefully get into the tech and innovation for kids as well. Um, those are side passions. Those are things that I've engaged in. Uh, mentorship has done so much for uh, myself and for um, me seeing the, the possibilities of, of what the world has to offer. Um, and the only way that you're going to transmit your knowledge and what you know and, and your passions and help other people is to engage with, with youth and the upcoming generations. So um, I would encourage everyone to try and reach out to look at mentorship opportunities um, to figure out um, people within your communities that have that love. Um, especially since, you know, all the studies here, and you can correct me, but I've been told that a lot of the studies here in Canada that have been done is that if you get, don't get a child by the age of, or grade six, you're never going to get them in the field of science. So these are some of the challenges that we're facing now is how do you start uh, making sure that um, some of our, our more technical stuff are done after. So that, that would be my thing that I would like to leave with you all. So thank you very much. So I've got two things, and um, um, one of them is if the, there's a tiny book by Andy Hoffman. Have some of you read it, How Culture Shapes the Climate Change Debate? Andy Hoffman is a professor in the States. He is an engineer uh, by training who went to business school and now collaborates with uh, social scientists. Uh, and it's a tiny, tiny, tiny book, and it's very, it's a quick read, and it really talks about the, 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 the culture, the, the cultural context of why we're not getting traction. Is, is that the right, did I get the right? Andy Hoffman, how culture shape, it's tiny. I bought, he came to York, I bought 25 of them a year and a half ago and just kept giving them to people. And then the other thing I would say is, um, one of the most important, the other really important document that people should read is uh, the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, this is this is this is hugely important, and read them because this is uh, the way forward. And I know that there is a lot of um, uh, there are some. some uh, I, I know that. that Phil Fontaine and Kathleen Mahoney have got a program about, I can't remember the name of it, but it's once you read them, here's what you can do to take action in support of First Nations in England. So that would be it. I have two quick comments. It worried me that Dawn looked straight at me when she said it's a tiny book. <laughs> I know I worked in TV for a long time, but really. Uh, the other thing is I loved Mel's example of uh, putting a stone in the ice in the lake. Uh, I still have a, although I moved to Calgary six years ago, you don't regret it, from Toronto. I still have a place in the woods in uh, North of Toronto. And that experiment is done inadvertently every spring by guys who drink too much and then take a snowmobile out on the ice. So that's what I call inadvertent citizen science. Anyway, uh, please uh, I name all the panelists, and if you could give them a round of applause, Mel Wilson, Terry McPherson. Cheryl Cardinal and Don Basin. Thank you all. Thank you.
Jordan Nelson speaking, Jay Ingram, and the panelists uh, uh, again. Uh, our motto at the Latin American Research Center is to expand, to broaden horizons. And I think this has been a wonderfully enlightening exercise in doing just that, not only a geographical but also epistemological horizons and ways of thinking. So please join me in thanking the panel for wonderful time.